Yeah. So then <coughs> we'll continue with lecture number seven, which dealt with <coughs> Fontaine's location theory and the bid rent model. And this is more about division of land use within an urban area. It says something about the mechanisms that can affect the way a city is divided between, uh, let's say, the central business district with consultancies, lawyers, upmarket, uh, fashion shops, and so on. And then you may have, at the outskirts of the city, you have the distribution centers, you have the car intensive, uh, let's say, bulky types of products, like furniture and so on, which, you, which needs, which are quite, you need motorized transport to, to, to carry your sofa home, so to speak. So those types of shops are normally located more in the outskirts of the city. So try to show you the, how, how we can explain or understand the distribution of uh, activities, economic activities within an urban area. So <coughs> the, the important observation is that land prices tend to fall with increasing distance from the city center, but at a diminishing rate. And the average land use land area occupied by each household or company tends to increase with distance from the city center, meaning that you have a substitution effect. Cheaper land, you use more land. Less, uh, more expensive land, you use less land because it's expensive. And that will affect the, let's say, the type of companies, industries, that will be attracted to, to these different areas. Distribution centers needs a lot of land. Lawyers, consultancies need much less land per, let's say, output unit, which may be a million turnover per year or whatever. And these are, <coughs> this theory from Fontaine is quite ancient. It's from 1826. He was the first to elaborate on, uh, on the distribution of, uh, of land use. And it was followed by Alonso Mills and Murth, the so-called AMM model, developed uh, during the 1960s. Well, this is the, the workings from, uh, from uh, Fontinum. And he was, of course, since we talk about 1826, he was occupied with agriculture. And he saw that uh, a high, a higher value type of, uh, of, of grain, like barley, tended to be grown closer to the market, which was here. Uh, and it costs more also to, to, to transport barley. So we have a distribution with barley closest to the city center, uh, and then from there on, wheat takes over. And outside of this, you have uh, wasteland, not, not, it may be grass for cows or cattle or whatever, but not, not any grown substances, like these two types of, of, of grain. And then <coughs> we, the, so this is linear bid rent curves, no substitution effects between land and, uh, and, uh, and activity. But this, these bid rent curves, they are actually allowing to substitute land for for other types of, uh, of, uh, of, of activities. So what I want you to, I'm not going to ask you about theoretical, let's say, elaboration on how these theories have, has, has come about, but 
more to to check whether you have understood how this how this actually work that you have a high value service sector industry which can pay quite a lot per square meter of land rent per square meter is the value of the vertical axis <coughs> which means that they may earn or produce quite a lot per square meter and they may do that because you just need a desk and a computer and a person and some other facilities of course but uh, per, per head they produce quite a lot of output whereas the distribution centers they need much more land per uh, let's say output unit and hence they will try to locate themselves where the land use land use costs are lower and of course they also need access to arterial roads and, uh, and the like which is not important for a consultancy they don't care about access to arterial roads because they don't need it they can do with a well-functioning public transport system more or less whereas the distribution sector is, is heavily dependent upon the, the road network to be able to do their business Then lecture eight, <coughs> I, I gave you a lecture on uh, on urban structures. Uh, where uh, I just went through four different types of urban structures from type one, which is a very dis dispersed structure, depend very car dependent typical for for uh, for american cities with uh, which have had well united states of america have had very low energy use costs low petrol prices big cars big road networks s small s city centers if any at all people live very dispersed and they drive a lot to to put it very short shorthandedly <coughs> but you may have cities on the other side of this scale with the very high densities uh, but not as high as, uh, as the really dense cities like Paris, Shanghai, Hong Kong and so on where <coughs> where uh, you have a very strong concentration around the central business district and it's easier to be less car dependent and more dependent upon public transit and it's also it's difficult to walk back here if you f if you have established a dispersed spatial structure it's very hard to reverse that into a dense compact city so it's very hard to get from type 1 and 2 and to type 3 and 4 type 3 and 4 are already dense and they, the density will in itself be a uh, a force that is centripetal because the density means that people are cooperating, working together, which we will see in the subsequent theories. It's very hard to break up a type 3 and 4 cities. They are sort of more robust. But it's very difficult for a type 1 and type 2 city to reach the center of a critical mass so that they can start to develop into a type 3 and 4 city. Some American cities are trying to do that, like Atlanta, which I showed you, but it's, uh, it's very difficult and costly to, to, to reverse, turn back a car-based structure into a dense urban structure. Then <coughs> I will 
speed up a bit because this is something that we have been quite recently through. Now I'm starting to talk about the mechanisms of economic growth in, in, uh, in more or less dense areas. And uh, <coughs> I'm back to the cumulative causation theory. And you try to elaborate a bit upon the mechanisms that are lies behind a kind of a self-sustaining growth pattern in which transport infrastructure can play a role. And we started with Myrdal's cumulative causation theory, which has these, these four loops where we are here. This, this thick frame is kind of the, the box where you have the action that we can take. In this, we are working in transport, so we, we talk about uh, improved transport infrastructure, among other things. If that action contributes to a location of new firms, let's say that a company is considering to move to this area because uh, there are uh, a good, a good uh, type of uh, local industrial culture, and uh, decent infrastructure, and perhaps even more, or improved infrastructure. Then, <coughs> if that happens, then we increase the size of the economic system. We expand local employment and population. We increase the local supply of skilled labor, which can, in turn, contribute to a fur even further growth or attract of, of new, new companies. The second loop <coughs> is that this localization needs secondary industries, supplying industries. They, the supplying industries are increasing in diversity and because of the scale effects, which Myrdal didn't, didn't discuss in detail, but the economies of scale with the diminishing marginal uh, sorry, diminishing, diminishing average cost curve, increased demand, reduced costs, increased competition, reduced, or, uh, then we had a shift in the average cost curve inwards, which also contributes to reduced costs. The third loop <coughs> is that capital will flow in to exploit the increased demand for, for, uh, for, the, for the local production here. And then we can have an expansion of firms serving the local home market, supporting, let's say, shops, food retailers, and so on. And the fourth loop <laughs> is that all this type of activity will cause also uh, increased taxes increased tax revenues, which may also make the public sector able to increase the level of service of public infrastructure services. But the mechanisms underlying here was not very deeply explained by Myrdal. But this framework is, is, is in my opinion, highly valid. And these are external factors, infrastructure policy, financial policy, and so on. Then we turn to endogenous growth theory, <coughs> which was actually based on an understanding of the importance of an increase in human capital. Knowledge, research and development, increasing the knowledge base, increasing the marginal productivity of one man year was the issue at stake here. By sharing a common labor market, people could move around, take the competence with them, introduce their uh, increased knowledge to a new company, gain more knowledge there, move on to the next company and so on. Seems very theoretical, but in many, let's say, denser areas, 
in bigger cities, that is what is happening. People are, have a quite high turnover, they circulate. Like, on, uh, like in, uh, for instance, uh, Lower Manhattan and Upper Manhattan, New York, Wall Street and, uh, and the real estate brokers uh, up, up on the upper, uh, upper Manhattan. People change their jobs all the time. So this is, this is mechanisms that work in, in, in real life. So that's, this is the, the labor market effects, and then you have the research and development efforts also taking place. Uh, I showed you the external effects uh, from research and development, which you should pay attention to. And then lecture 10a was about new economic geography, the Krugman approach, where <coughs> I took this linkages between suppliers and, uh, and uh, the manufacturing industries and between the manufacturing industries and the customers. That was the issue at stake in this theory, where we have this. This is also a contribution to the understanding of the loops in Myrdal's, uh, Myrdal's uh, figure. That uh, the clustering of economic activities as a result of market size, scale effects at company level, imperfect competition, that the competition is strong enough to make the prices be forced down to not pure monopoly prices, but to average cost prices. Meaning that if you make a uh, movement along the increasing returns to scale curve, the diminishing average cost curve, prices will drop and that will be a competitive factor for this economic system. And if transport costs contributes to this clustering of economic activities, then the transport costs plays a role in this model, which they actually do. You should note the forward and backward linkages. Forward linkages towards the end customer, downstream in the supply chain. Meaning that you increase the demand for the existing firms. Then we have this linkage downstream towards the market side. If you have a new entry, you increase the size of the market. The number of end customers increases and the production, the demand for the products increase. And if you have this uh, diminishing average cost curve, prices will drop a bit. Here, <coughs> upstream, that means towards the cost side, towards the supplier side here. So if you get a new firm in, they demand more supplies, movement along the average cost curve, the price of the supplies drop a bit, but not only for this company, the new firm, but also for all the other companies in the area. So you get a pecuniary external effect, meaning that the effects are working through the market prices. And we split the external effects into pure or technical, research and development externalities is an example of that, and pecuniary external effects, which works through the market by means which is uh, a result of reduced average costs. So you should pay attention to these, uh, these uh, definitions. <coughs> then <coughs> we proceeded with wider economic impacts of transport infrastructure. And this is, uh, this is kind of recent research, ongoing research. Uh, this uh, wider economic impacts thing was developed in the, from 2005 and onwards, trying to find out whether the wider economic impacts of transport infrastructure 
could be claimed to increase the benefits of transport infrastructure investments. And uh, <coughs> the reason here is that if transport infrastructure causes positive productivity effects measured by the fact that you get more output per unit input, you have the same mechanisms as, as I have described under new economic geography and endogenous growth theory, namely that you follow this diminishing average cost curve. You get more out of the human capital, you may get more out of the production equipment. And this is how we conventionally address this. And this is based on labor market integration meaning that you link, let's say, <coughs> labor market in the outskirts of the central business district with the central business district by making commuting easier. And we assume that the difference between working in the outskirts and working in the city center has a wage gap. So if you start to commute, you will earn more money. And you will start to commute, and you will commute as long as you can benefit from it, as long as you can earn more money. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't care to commute, right? So you commute to, uh, to, uh, to this point where the costs equals the, the, the additional wages that you can get, and you have the equi equilibrium here. If you live, let's say, closer to the city center, you will get a higher rent in terms of additional wages as compared to the costs that you pay for the commuting. And here we have, this is a quasi-spatial dimension because we haven't, we haven't measured it in terms of distance, but in terms of the number of workers that can be attracted that, and that can start to interact with the activities in the, central, in the city center. And the wage gap is, is caused by a, productivity dif a difference in productivity. Because wage, gross wage, is a proxy for productivity. And now if we <coughs> change or reduce the transport costs, simply by, by changing the slope of this, uh, this uh, commuting cost curve, which is simply the transport cost per kilometer, assumed to be linear, we get a shift in costs, a reduced costs for the users that were commuting in the first place, according to alpha, and we get additional benefits for the new let's say, number of workers that start to commute because the commuting has become cheaper because of the improved in transport. And the beta is then the benefit, and this uh, is the costs. So beta is the surplus for the new commuters. This is what you capture in a traditional cost-benefit analysis. So this has this is not wider economic impacts. This is the traditional way of assessing such a, an issue. But here <coughs> we have altered the, let's say, the wage gap curve. Because we say that the wage gap is increasing with distance from the city centre. So close to the city center, the wage gap is zero, and it increases and with, a, with a diminishing growth rate. So <coughs> this means that, <coughs> and this is the same change in transport cost as we had in the previous slide, the same alpha for the existing commuters, but then things start to happen here because of this increased wage gap, when you introduce a number of new workers into this economic system, make it larger, 
the productivity gain <coughs> will increase from here to here and also the productivity gain because because of the learning effects and the interaction effects that will affect the whole of the labor market. You get this delta as an increased benefit from this increased size of the economic system. And this is actually rooted on new economic geography and endogenous growth theory. <coughs> and the beta is still the additional uh, net, net benefits for the uh, additional uh, number of workers that start to commute, and this is the costs. These are the costs. So we see that uh, beta plus delta from this assumption that the marginal productivity increases with the size of the economic system, and you see, mark the word, endogenous productivity which has something to do with the endogenous growth theory, of course. It's generated from inside of the system because of the system characteristics, and the system characteristics changes because the size of the economic system increases, in this case. Because <coughs> the reduction in transport costs can attract more, a large number of commuters. So, uh, in this case, if you compare delta plus beta with only beta, we see that there is an additional benefit connected to this, to this uh, wider economic impact, which is based on increased size of the economic system, reduced average costs, and all that nice features of that we have learned from endogenous growth and uh, new economic geography. Then <coughs> we ended this course with Porter's cluster theory and industry clusters. And you should just pay attention to the definitions of a cluster. It's not only a bunch of, re of similar companies located in the same place, as you can see with distribution centers located in the same spot and so on, but it, there needs to be a set of related industries, a supporting public sector and a good and supporting banking sector present. And I used uh, some time to explain that during, during this, uh, this lecture. And in the sense that transport systems can affect the linkages between players in a cluster, transport will contribute to, to, uh, to this clustering effect. And Porter doesn't discuss much of scale effects and uh, things like that. He's more into the, let's say, the kind of sociological workings of systems where people are working closely together with the trade-off between competition and collaboration, trust, informal structures, and so on, which is an important explanatory factor behind, behind the growth of uh, different industry clusters. And this is, uh, this is the, the definition. And this, and <coughs> The main driving force behind Porter's explanation is this demand conditions, where you have a demand from local customers that are advanced, and it may be of a kind that you can serve this, uh, this uh, that this demand from a local customer can also be relevant in the global sense. So if you manage to develop products under a certain pressure from the local customers, you may also be successful in the global market. That is what is, done, is said here. And then you need related and supporting industries in a collaborative structure and so on to, to make this 
to make this uh, sustainable, the growth of, uh, of an industry cluster. <coughs> then I turn to to a more, let's say, formal discussion of, of, of this cluster problem or challenge, where <coughs> you could assume that because of the external effects taking place between players in the cluster, with diminishing average costs and uh, increased productivity from, uh, from uh, human capital and so on, we can assume that the return <coughs> in the industry cluster increases with the size, but at a diminishing rate. The return in other industries decrease with increasing size. And then we talk about other industries that doesn't have these, that they don't have these, these uh, let's say, mechanisms that contributes to a growth in human capital, reduction in, uh, in average costs and so on. Very stylized. But the point is that when the size of the cluster grows, the difference in returns on, on invested capital will attract more capital to the cluster at the expense of the traditional industry. And the length of this baseline here is the total amount of the investment, investments available for the investors. <coughs> and it can be shared between the cluster and other industries. But you need to invest as much as up to B to be able to, to, to come into this path, along to, to enter into this path, which is, can be then called a self-sustaining growth path because of the increased difference in return between the cluster and the, and the traditional industries. If you don't reach B, <laughs> you will end up in C, where everything, all the investments will go to the other industries. So the distance <coughs> in terms of uh, investment needs to get from this point and to this point is critical for a cluster to become viable. And I mentioned uh, Norwegian and the Finnish mobile cell, cell phone industry as an example. Because the Norwegian cell phone industry in the mid-80s, mid-1980s, was at this point B. It was small, they were very active in product development, and they were at the takeoff, in the sort of takeoff phase to, to start moving along a path like this. But then the Finnish government <coughs> launched an investment program for their electronics industry, and they supported a well-known manufacturer known as Nokia, and they pushed a lot of money into that industry. So they just decided to invest a lot to get to B, and they managed to start this self-sustaining growth. And it worked well for 30 years, more or less, <coughs> a bit less than that. And Nokia is now bought by, uh, by Microsoft. And they have still some activities in, in Finland, but it's, it's not as, is, as, it used, as it used to be. This is considered as a stable equilibrium. You have a large cluster. If you reduce it, you will lose money because the return on the cluster investments are still are then higher than the traditional industry. You will not expand because then the other industries are more profitable because you need some of that as well. So this is considered as a stable equilibrium. But very few clusters are at this level. Most of them are in some stage between B and A. And in Norway, <coughs> even this strong local industry cluster here may not be, may not be in essence, perhaps not too far from B. It's, it's difficult to say exactly where 
of the distance between A and B the local industry here is. But some of the <coughs> some of the big the big clusters that we have seen in other countries. And I think it's fair to say that the, the car making cluster in Chicago or, de uh, or Detroit, per particularly Detroit in the US, was seen considered as being strong, big, and an A case. But then suddenly, because of some fighting with the unions and so on, two big car makers decided to just move out to Detroit. And that was enough to, to more or less break down the whole cluster. So it's, uh, it's difficult to, to say that A, to say which clusters that are actually sort of on safe ground to be here. Most of them, I think, will be in that direction towards B. If one or two of the cornerstone players in the cluster moves out, it's, it's vulnerable to, to, to that, I will say. So this is <coughs> the final slide of this presentation, this summary lecture. This is a picture of Manhattan taken before 2001. You can see easily see why. Dense, very high land use costs, uh, tall buildings, um, a lot of human capital involved in the production of lawyers, consultancy, finance here. Wall Street is inside here somewhere. But perhaps you have a, I hope that you have a slightly better understanding of why we get this kind of structures in some areas, some parts of the world. Uh, in other countries, more developing countries, you might be able to take the same picture, but then you don't find much activity around this urban concentration. And that may be due to the lack of infrastructure, transport infrastructure. Going from a central business district and out to the, to the surrounding uh, areas. And that may also be a very big challenge for, uh, for policy makers to, to handle. So that's it. Then uh, I will uh, switch, uh, stop this and then I'll switch to a very short uh, run through of the proposed answers to your uh, your uh, two group works. <coughs> <coughs>